Have you ever had the opportunity to look at something through a microscope? Maybe in high school or college biology class. It's nothing short of amazing what you can see through a microscope. Take a look at what you see and tell me what you think it might be. This is chalk. Who would have guessed that chalk is so beautiful? Speaking of beauty, here's another one. What you are looking at is ordinary household dust. Now I know why I never dust at home. I don't want to disrupt the beauty of it all. Can you guess what this is? I think somebody got it right. A microscopic look at what a cat's tongue looks like. That's why cat's tongues are so rough to the touch. One more though, and this last one kind of haunts me. This is what chocolate looks like under a microscope. Okay, okay. <laughs> So I made that one up, but the next time you're tempted to eat too much chocolate, I want you to think of this, all right? <laughs> and to remember that, oh, what is it? Somebody said, it's, it's an exotic worm under a microscope, but it, it is real, it is real. But the next time you think of this or eat chocolate, I want you to remember that Microscopes remind us that there is a whole lot more to our world than meets the eye. The closer you look at something, the more you see. And what's true of our physical world is equally true of God's word, the Holy Scriptures. Sometimes it's good to, to read a broad swath of chapters in one sitting to get a sense of the, the, the sweep and the context of what is being said. But, but other times it's good, as it were, to train a microscope on a particular short passage of Scripture, close in on it, Linger on it, keep coming back to it, drilling deeper and deeper to see what details emerge from the passage that you ordinarily might gloss right over. So that's what we're going to do in the month of January. For the five Sundays of January, five different times, we're going to come back to the same nine-verse passage of Scripture that you just heard read, 1 Thessalonians chapter one, drilling deeper and deeper each week, seeing what God has for us there. I've chosen this particular chapter because many experts believe this was the first chapter of the New Testament ever written. The Gospels, as best we can tell, were written a few years later. First Thessalonians, we believe, is the first book of the New Testament that was written. So you just heard the first chapter of the New Testament ever written. And in it, it manages to, to grasp what I would call the New Testament mindset. Nine short verses that capture how we as followers of Jesus are supposed to see the world and approach life. So let's say a prayer and then we'll fire up our electron microscopes. God, we want to see what you see. We want to think more like you do. We want to approach life the way Jesus taught. What does that look like? Show us. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. Paul and his two co-authors, Silvanus and Timothy, write, we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that God 
has chosen you. Note that key phrase, please. God has chosen you. The New Testament mindset begins with that simple yet profound proposition. You have been chosen. You are wanted by God. Sometimes that's hard for us to believe. A manager was uh, interviewing uh, a prospective employee. So at one point, the manager says to the interviewee, so tell me about yourself. The interviewee says, I'd rather not. I kind of want this job. (laughs) Often that's how we feel in the presence of God. God says, so tell me about yourself. We say, I'd rather not. I kind of want to be on your team. Earlier, Pastor Chris reminded us of what it was like in in grade school at at recess when teams were being chosen. Maybe it was for a kickball game and and two captains, of course, course, are appointed. And then those captains have all of the rest of us line up in a long line and they begin to choose. And of course, first they choose the elite athletes. Then they choose the okay athletes. Then... There's the rest of us, the dregs, the I don't want that kid on my team people. And you're standing there just praying, don't let me be the last one chosen. Or worse yet, don't let me be the one who's not chosen at all, left out in the cold. When we hear that word chosen, that's what we tend to think of. A competitive process where the the elites have every advantage. We imagine God lining us all up in a big line and, and God looks us over and God chooses the most spiritually gifted. Those who have the most spiritual potential. And the rest of us are left out in the cold. But that's not how God chooses. We know because Jesus says so. Luke chapter 14. There Jesus compares the kingdom of God to a great heavenly banquet to which everyone is invited, especially those who are considered least Likely, in the words of Jesus, the host of that great banquet, who represents God, says to the angels, Luke 14, 21, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. In this context, the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame represent the spiritually poor. The spiritually crippled, the spiritually blind, the spiritually Lame. In other words, those of us who are spiritually disabled, those of us who are spiritually challenged, Jesus teaches us that God's banquet table is going to be full of people like us, spiritually challenged people. Apparently, God has a soft spot for we who are spiritually challenged. Challenged. I saw a photograph the other day that looks like this. Notice anything unusual about this puppy dog? This puppy dog has a tail in a place where it was never meant to be. In the center of his forehead, he has a tail. When I saw this photograph, my first thought was, oh, I would love to adopt him and give him a wonderful home. I would choose him any day. That's how God feels about you. Jesus says, bring me the spiritually crippled, the spiritually blind, the spiritually lame. 
Bring me those who, spiritually speaking, are like a puppy dog with a tail in a place where no tail is ever supposed to be. I want you. And you say, you're talking to me, Jesus? And Jesus says, yeah, I'm talking to you. Several years after the Korean War ended, Lee Strobel says there was a Korean woman who had an affair with an American soldier. He soon departed and went back to the United States. She went on several months later to birth a biracial baby girl whose skin was much lighter and hair much curlier than the typical Korean child. In that particular time, in that particular culture, biracial children were hated and the mothers of biracial children severely persecuted. So it wasn't uncommon in that culture for a mother of a biracial child to abandon that child or to even kill a biracial child. But this particular mother who birthed this biracial child, let's, let's call her Bada, a common Korean name, she decided she was going to keep her baby. She was going to try to raise Bada, and she did so for seven years until the persecution became so overwhelming she abandoned her little girl. Can you imagine being seven years old and you're living in the streets? People called Bada the worst Korean word, Tuki, which means alien devil. And soon she began to internalize that feeling about herself. After being on the streets for two years, she was finally taken into an orphanage. At the orphanage one day, Word began to spread that an American couple was going to be coming in looking to adopt a little boy. So all day long, Bada gave baths to the little boys and combed their hairs to make sure they would be presentable. Everybody was excited because some little boy was going to get taken home, was going to have a home. Then the couple arrived. Bada says the man was really tall. He had huge hands he and his wife stood there as the orphanage workers lined up all the little boys in front of them. Bada says, I watched as this man with huge hands slowly picked up each little boy, held him, tears streaming down his cheeks all the way across the line. He was weeping, she was weeping. Bada says, it was obvious they would have taken them all if they could have. Then, Bada says, in her own words, he saw me out of the corner of his eye. I was nine, but didn't even weigh 30 pounds. I had worms in my body, lice in my hair, and boils all over. I was full of scars. The man came over to me. I looked up at him. He put his huge hand on my face, and then he started rattling off something in English. What's he saying? What's he saying? Someone translated. He was saying, I want this child. This is the child for me. When the New Testament says, God has chosen you, that's what it means. Even if you're the spiritual equivalent of a puppy dog with a tail in the middle of your forehead, or I guess I should say especially if you're the spiritual equivalent of a puppy dog with a tail in a place it's not supposed to be, God wants you. Have you ever said yes? Jeff, I'm not worthy. Have you been listening to what I'm saying? God wants you anyway. Have you ever accepted consciously, intentionally, Jesus' invitation to become part of his team? If not, you could do that today. Wherever you are, you could say aloud, yes, Jesus, I accept your invitation. 
There is a seat at God's banquet table that has your name on it. Whosoever will may come. Jesus wants you on his team. But, of course, that leads to the next obvious question. If I have been chosen, the next obvious question is, chosen for what? Verse 3 gives us the answer. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 says, We, Paul, Silvanus, Timothy, we always make mention of you in our prayers. Constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the three specific things that are listed there. You might call these the big three. Elsewhere in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the Apostle Paul says, faith, hope, and love abide these three. In other words, these are the three great virtues that are supposed to characterize the life of those of us who follow Jesus. Faith, hope, and love. You'll notice that Paul reiterates that same litany of nouns in our scripture passage today, except he throws a descriptive word in front of each of those nouns to give us a better feel for what kind of faith, what kind of love, what kind of hope we are called to embrace as followers of Jesus. We are called to embrace the work of faith the labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. Let's take a quick look at each of those three key terms. First, as followers of Jesus, we are called to the work of faith. Often we're tempted to think of faith as being when we dare to ask great things of God in prayer. God Heal the sick. Feed the hungry. Comfort the brokenhearted day by day. Great things, I pray. And that's wonderful. But the kind of faith we are called to doesn't stop there. It goes well beyond the simple act of boldly asking. St. Thomas More put it this way. The things, good Lord, that we pray for, give us the grace to labor for. Leslie uh, Weatherhead tells the story of a little girl who was troubled because her older brother trapped rabbits. She pleaded with him to stop to no avail. One day, her mother overhears the little girl praying, saying, God Please keep Tommy from trapping rabbits. Please don't let them be trapped. They can't. They won't. Amen. Her mom said, honey, how can you be so sure God won't let the rabbits be trapped? She said, because I jumped on the traps and sprung them. <laughs> that is the kind of faith we're called to. The work of faith. Not a passive faith. Oh God, solve all the problems of the world. I have faith. You can do it. As William Carey said, ask great things of God. Attempt great things for God. Or as Jesus' brother James said, James 2, 17, faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. I was reading a story the other day about a guy who I guess when he gets bored and for kicks, he's, he's had these little round decals made. He'll walk into a public restroom and he'll stick this little decal on a paper towel dispenser. This is what the decal looks like. You probably can't read it, but the, the little round decal says, voice activated, say loudly, paper towel now. You can imagine, of course, somebody approaching one of these paper towel dispensers in a public restroom, and you pause, and you think for a second, and you think, well, maybe it's some kind of new technology, right? So, so you say, paper towel now. Nothing happens. 
So of course you say it louder. Paper towel, now! Well, this guy's probably in the stall laughing his head off. Paper towel, now! Nothing happens! Because words alone aren't enough. If you want a paper towel, you have to act. You have to wave your hand over the censer. Faith without action is dead, standing alone. We are called to the work of faith. Monday, August the 8th, 1993, a 31-year-old woman named Sophia White burst into the USC Medical Center nursery wielding a 38 caliber gun looking for a nurse named Staten, Annette Staten, whom White said had stolen her husband. When White saw Staten, she fired six times. Two of the bullets struck and wounded Staten. Staten retreated into the emergency room area. White chased after her. When she saw her again, she fired again. It's at that point that another nurse, Joan Black, did the unthinkable. She walked up to the woman with the gun and hugged her. She spoke words of comfort to her as she held her there in her arms. The woman broke down and said, I have no reason to go on living. Nurse Black said, you have a lot of pain. We all have a lot of pain in life. Slowly, the woman with the gun began to raise it to her own head to shoot herself. Nurse Black calmly moved her arm back down as she continued to hold her and speak words of comfort. Afterwards, an Associated Press reporter asked Nurse Black, what were you thinking? She said, I saw a sick person and had to take care of her. There were lots of people at the USC Medical Center that day who were praying, Jesus, save us. There was only one who put feet to her faith. That's the kind of faith We're called to, as followers of Jesus, not a passive faith, a working faith. In your life right now, what great work of faith are you being called to engage? But remember, there's also that second key phrase. We are called, one, to the work of faith. Number two, to the labor of love. What an interesting phrase. We don't normally associate love and labor, right? Love is supposed to be easy and spontaneous, when in reality, it almost always requires great effort. My dad is now uh, 88 years old. I love him dearly, but he is a handful. For starters, he's very hard of hearing. He had some hearing aids, you know, the kind that Uh, fit over the back of your ear, and they worked fine, but he would rarely wear them because he said, they're uncomfortable. They make my ears sore. We kept trying to tell him, you know, if you'd wear them consistently, your ear would adjust to them, and it wouldn't. But no, no, he wasn't going to wear So I worked with him and the Veterans Administration for nine months to get him a brand new pair of -of state-of-the-art hearing aids, a different model, the kind that gently fit in your ear canal, nothing over the back of the ear. He wore them a couple times. He loved them. He could hear again. And then he stopped wearing them. It's been months. They just sit there. When I say, Dad, why don't you wear your hearing aids so you can hear something? He says, they're uncomfortable. They make my ears hurt. (sighs) So when I talk to my dad every day on the phone or in person, I literally have to talk to him like this. (laughs) Speaking, I'm not exaggerating, speaking at the top of my lungs, right, Andrea? You know when you have dinner with, speaking to him at the top of my lungs and syncopating the words so that he can distinctly hear each different word. (laughs) Mm. 
I could go on. He has this sports watch that speaks to an app on his phone, pretty high tech for an 88-year-old guy, right? Of course, we installed it, but he doesn't see well, and so he has real trouble seeing the icons on his app on the phone. You know, you can push an icon that reads out your blood pressure, another one that is your heart rate, so on and so forth. He likes doing that. One of the buttons, one of the icons is for tracking a woman's menstrual cycle. (laughs) He can't see it, so he pushes the button, right? And for some reason, his app always gets stuck there. You just have to wait until like eight hours later, it magically resets itself. And so one day I'm showing him, I say, okay, now dad, don't push this button. He says, you mean this one? He pushes it and we get stuck on the menstrual cycle thing again. I said, dad, don't push that button. Jesus doesn't just call us to love people. He calls us to labor to love them. God's love, agape love, always requires effort. A woman was at church one Sunday. The offering was being taken back in the days when you could pass an offering plate in. She was fumbling through her purse looking for the check she had written for the offering plate when a large TV remote falls out on the ground. The usher, seeing it, bends down, picks it up, hands it back to her, whispers in her ear, saying, do you always bring your TV remote to church? She whispers back, no, but my husband refused to come to church with with me this morning, and I figured the evilest thing I could legally do to him was to take the remote. Maybe you're participating in worship on the live stream today and your spouse refused to participate with you today because they've got to watch three hours of NFL pregame shows to get ready for the big games today and you're so frustrated you were tempted to steal the remote. Love, real love, takes labor and effort. Reverend Glenn McDonald puts it this way, sharing life with another person pretty much guarantees that before long, in one way or another, you're going to drive each other crazy. (laughs) What happens next makes all the difference. Jose Maria Escriva says, don't say, that person bothers me. Instead say, that person sanctifies me. In other words, that person gives me a chance to Practice my faith. So the next time you, someone is driving you nuts at home, at work, in your neighborhood, stop, smile, and say, you sanctify me. You're my labor of love. In your life right now, who is God calling you to labor to love? Remember, this goes to the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's a bold, beautiful way of life. Ah, but there's one last phrase. We are called, number one, to the work of faith. Number two, to the labor of love. And number three, steadfast hope. Not just ordinary hope, you know, fluffy and breezy, but it evaporates quickly in the face of hard times. No, no. We're called to a particular kind of hope. Steadfast hope. The kind of hope that looks directly into an overwhelming situation and says, I refuse to yield to despair. Let me close with this. A couple years ago, uh, NPR's Andrea Dukakis did a story about a father named Frank whose young adult son is hopelessly addicted to heroin and living on the streets of Denver. Many different times, Frank and his wife had tried to help their son get out of addiction. All efforts had failed. But Frank stubbornly refused to give up on his son. So he contacted Chris Connor, a well-known 
homelessness advocate in Denver. Chris has helped many parents locate their lost children on the streets, but Chris says, I never met a parent who went this far. Because you see, Frank didn't just want to know where his son was. He wanted to be with him there. He literally began living on the streets with his son for a short while. In his own words, when he first approached his son on the street, Frank describes it this way. He says, he has no idea I'm walking towards him. I can see he can't stand up without the support of a building. He would appear drunk to most people, but from past experience, I knew it was heroin. I go up to him. He starts to turn his back on me. I don't care. I just grab him and squeeze him as hard as I can. For the next week, Frank was his son's shadow. Walking the streets with him by day, sleeping on the riverbank with him by night. Growing his beard long, eating handout sandwiches, shooing rats away by night. When Andrea Dukakis asked him, What were you thinking when you did this? He said, I was just thinking, I have to go to him there. I have to be where he is and show him love. I have to show him how much his family still loves him. That's what steadfast love looks like. The stubborn refusal to give up on someone, something, or even yourself. In your life right now, where is God calling you to refuse to let go of steadfast hope? Actually, when you think about it, what Frank did for his son is the perfect example of what God does for us. Even if you are the spiritual equivalent of a puppy dog with a tail on your forehead. Or I should say, especially if you're the spiritual equivalent of a puppy dog with a tail on your head. God still wants you. Whosoever will may come. There's a seat at the banquet table that has your name on it. Have you ever consciously intentionally said yes. The New Testament mindset begins there. I am a child of God. I say yes. Jesus, I want to be part of your team. If you're at a place in life where maybe today you're ready for the first time to make that decision, I would like to suggest that you consider memorializing that decision by going to lifejourney.church slash links. And when you land there, you'll see a page that has a whole bunch of options. The second option down, bright green, says response form. If you click on that, it'll take you to a page. And if you scroll down, you'll come to a place on the page where you'll find this language. I'm making a decision to become a follower of Jesus or to rededicate myself to that decision. If you check off that box and hit submit, I'll give you a call this week. We'll schedule a time to talk over the phone or in person, and we'll talk about options for moving forward, practical options for moving forward with that decision. The new year is upon us. It's the perfect time to make a new beginning or to renew an old beginning. Don't just sit there. Say yes. God wants you. You are chosen. Amen.